Welcome to the IEF Lecture Series. We're so glad that you're joining with us and we pray that you'll be blessed as you receive from this teaching. And so let's uh, commit our time together in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we just want to thank you that we have this opportunity of belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just want to thank you that he has been given all authority that we might be able to, along with his help and empowering, um, that we have this privilege of making disciples to all nations throughout our world. And we just want to thank you that David uh, Zadok has been able to come and join with us this evening. And uh, we just pray that you'll be with him as he speaks. May you just empower him by your Holy Spirit to be able to speak clearly and that he would be getting your help uh, just to uh, speak clearly about uh, this whole aspect of uh, Messianic Jews and their relationship to ourselves as Christians throughout the world. And so, Lord, we just uh, commit our time to you, uh, asking that you would bless our time together. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I am very thankful and grateful for this opportunity, and uh, and it's always an honor for me to fill in for my dear friend uh, uh, John Woodhead. Um, both my wife and I, even before we got married, which was about thirty-one years ago, uh, knew John separately. So I'm glad that I can be um, able to fill uh, in for him, even though I'm. Sorry that he's not feeling well, um, and but uh, I'm thankful for this. Um, just a very brief words about uh, myself. I was born here uh, in Israel. From age of three, I grew up in Iran uh, at the better times uh, before the Islamic Revolution. And then uh, because of the Islamic Revolution, my family decided to send me to the States for different reasons at the age of 16. And uh, it was there that uh, in San Diego, California, that the Lord opened my heart and I was uh, converted. So I'm sure you must have heard about the wandering Jew. Uh, so I am one example of that because by age of 16, I was already living in three uh, different countries. And uh, uh, of course, my conversion caused a huge uh, issue uh, with my family. Eventually, when I uh, came back, they uh, uh, and realized that my faith wasn't going in a way. They uh, literally and physically kicked me out of the house. They said, we don't have a son. Um, uh, you're dead for us. And even when my wife and I got married, uh, nobody came uh, to a wedding. Uh, even though only after our first daughter was born, things started to change. But the relationship nevertheless uh, always remained uh, very tense. So that gives you a little bit of background of um, in some ways what it means sometimes for a Jewish uh, person uh, to, become, uh, uh, to become a Christian or to be converted. Uh, currently I'm uh, pastoring a church uh, called Grace and Truth. It was, it is still one of the older churches in Israel. It was a uh, started in 1976. Uh, I've been an elder in that church uh, since 1990, and I've been pastoring it for the last uh, almost 14 years. I'm almost the, the, uh, I'm also the director of uh, Hagefen Publishing, where uh, we publish uh, books, uh, mainly in Hebrew, but also in a uh, little bit of Arabic and Ham Amharic, uh, Russian, of course, and we've done one or two books in uh, Farsi and also in Turkish. So that also connects me a little bit uh, with the education side. And also just briefly, um, um, I would mention about my involvement uh, with IEF, uh, but also I'm now uh, part of the Mahon uh, Tzu, or the Mahon Tzu Institute, which uh, is really the goal is, uh, it's actually the first, uh, I would say, uh, messianic uh, Christian uh, research uh, platform. And uh, the purpose is really to encourage non-believers, first of all, to read 
the Hebrew Bible with open mind and to empower Israeli believers in their Bible reading and study in a deeper and meaning, um, uh, meaningful way the scripture, but of course is encouraging uh, the believers, uh, both Jews and non-Jews, uh, to be more involved in academic uh, biblical research. So that's just a little bit uh, of my, uh, my background. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the issue of um, Messianic Jews um, and uh, Christians, or I don't want to say Messianic Jews versus Christian in terms of uh, the name. But I do want to start uh, with talking a little bit about Israel uh, and also what God is doing in Israel, because I think those two things are certainly uh, very much related. I believe that whatever our theological background may be, uh, if we read our Bibles, we understand that the big story of the, um, uh, of the Bible uh, that we find both in the Old and the New Testament, um, and which is obviously the most important story uh, of the whole world, uh, started here in, in Israel. Uh, not only started here in the land of Israel, but it was also uh, with the people of Israel, with the calling of God to, uh, to Abraham. And also, um, we know from the scriptures that it would also um, end here, in a sense, the, the place, this is the place to which Christ uh, will come to take his people to himself. Um, and an important part uh, of those people that would be in his kingdom uh, forever and ever in the in that uh, glorious and eternal uh, eternity, uh, glorious eternity, are the people uh, of Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel uh, are actually the only nation and people that are uh, mentioned by name in Revelation 7. So, so the beginning and the end um, is about Israel. But I think there is not always consensus and maybe some even, uh, I would say, to some degree, misconception about the in-between, uh, particularly after the coming of Christ and the place of Israel since um, uh, what is happening uh, to the people of Israel and what is the place of the, of the Jewish people and Israel um, in this uh, in-between time between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. And of course, in 1948, uh, when Israel became a state, that issue even uh, became much more, uh, I would say, in the under the radar uh, of um, of the church and uh, and the Gentile church as well as obviously uh, here in Israel. And I would talk about that just briefly as well um, uh, in a short while. Um, so so this is what it's it's all about, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, but I want to start. Uh, by saying that it's important to say that it's not about Israel and it's not uh, even about uh, the Jewish people, but it's really all about God, his glory, his redemptive plan of the, for the salvation of the world, which includes both Jews uh, and Gentiles. And yet God in, in his great wisdom, not because of anything good necessarily in, in, in us, in the people of Israel, chose us to become a showcase uh, for his grace and his love. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, I uh, just want to read the, the verses 6 to 8, um, uh, Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 8, it says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And then he says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all the people. But it is because the Lord loves you and in keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And of course, uh, tonight is the second uh, uh, part of the Passover uh, here in Israel. 
Um, and uh, tomorrow night is uh, kind of the ending. And on Saturday night, uh, uh, the, the Jewish people here would uh, start eating also uh, the leavened bread after these uh, seven days. So I think that here it's, it's a clear case that we realize that God chose us not because we were many, but I would add not because we are the great uh, people, uh, not because we are lovely, but only because God uh, chose us uh, uh, for his glory and for his purposes. I think that uh, uh, even when we come to the New Testament, when Jesus came, even though he came mainly and foremost uh, to the lost house of Israel, John the Baptist, uh, when he saw that many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, were coming to be baptized, uh, he told them uh, he told them this in Matthew chapter three verse nine. He says, "And do not presume to say to yourself, to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham." So, in other words, uh, the fact that by birth, uh, by lineage. Uh, we are Jewish sons of uh, Abraham, in the sight of God has no meaning, uh, but it's only uh, about what God has done in and through us that makes us uh, who we are. Uh, you know, I, I served for about 18 years uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces and the Ministry of Defense as a major uh, here. And I know that our military superiority that is almost non-questionable is really not because we are so great and so smart, but really because the hand of the Lord is on us. And I think uh, certainly up to the coming of Christ, uh, we can see the promise that uh, God made already in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, gave to the uh, said to the serpent, talking about uh, the seed of the woman uh, shall bruise him on the head. And of course, he has kept uh, the seed of the woman till the coming of Christ. And because of his faithfulness, uh, he has also continues uh, to protect us and keep us because I believe that he's not yet done uh, with us. As people of Israel, we were not an example for others. We are supposed to be the light uh, to the nations, um, but we failed uh, miserably. Uh, we became, rather than the covenant uh, keeper, we became a covenant breaker. And God displayed and continues to display his faithfulness as a covenant keeper, no matter what. And I think um, the great example of that, uh, which became a pattern actually, uh, is what we found in Genesis 15, when God made that uh, uh, covenant with Abraham. Um, it was God alone who passed uh, between the cut animals, uh, though according to the Near East customs of the time, in such signing of agreement and cutting uh, of the covenant, both parties would walk between the cut animals uh, and with a loud voice, they would declare, may it be to me like these cut animals, if I do not keep my part uh, of the agreement. Uh, and yet, as I said, it was only the Lord uh, that by the torch, kind of uh, through the torch, walked between those uh, cut animals. And that became a pattern uh, of God's dealing uh, with his people in the rest of the history. So that's, I think it's a little bit of background that I think it's really important for us when we come to the issue of uh, uh, Messianic Jews and Christians and what God is doing uh, today um, in Israel and among the Jewish people. Um, I usually uh, prefer to refer to myself as a Jewish Christian Though in Hebrew, I use the term uh, Messianic Jew or uh, Yehudi Meshichi. And the reason I prefer the term Jewish Christian uh, is for a few reasons. The first thing is, of course, um, I was born 
as a Jew, both my parents um, for many, many generations uh, are Iraqi Jews. In fact, at least for at least uh, for 400 years and maybe even more, uh, we can uh, check uh, our lineage and we were a part of the uh, Iraqi Jews. And uh, I sometimes jokingly or uh, obviously I don't know, but I say that we are maybe part of those uh, exiled Jews in Babylon who, when during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were able to come back. Uh, many uh, preferred to to stay. And as you may know, the Iraqi Jews or the Babylonian Jews uh, are the only Jews that for 2,500 years, they maintained a continuous existence outside of uh, Jerusalem, of course, and uh, uh, during uh, the Second World War II, um, that chain was uh, broken, and we know what is happening uh, to the Jews back then. That's when also the time when both my parents and uh, the rest of my family uh, escaped from Iraq and, uh, and came, to, uh, came to Israel. Uh, so that's part of my Jewish heritage. The other side, and of course, I use the word Christian. And I use the word Jewish Christian because the name Christ, what becomes common between myself as a Jew and uh, yourself as Gentile uh, Christian. So I prefer uh, to use that name. The other reason that I sometimes in English prefer not to use the, the term Messianic Jews is that uh, in our history, in the history of the Jewish people, uh, there were few false messiahs. If you travel nowadays in Israel, everywhere we see uh, a big signs with a big picture of the dead rabbi uh, of the Chabad, Rabbi Schneitzer from uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and under his name, it says, long live the Messiah. And uh, his followers, uh, which are one of the larger sects of uh, uh, Orthodox Jews, uh, they believe that he is the Messiah. And even though he's been dead uh, for a decade or so, uh, they believe that he's the Messiah and one day would come back. Uh, so that's another reason that um, I often prefer not to use uh, the term messianic uh, messianic Jews. But there is also other side to that. Uh, sadly, uh, for almost 2,000 years, the history of the, I would say, quote, quote, uh, Christians uh, towards the Jewish people have been one of, um, of uh, hostile. Um, we, we go back to the time, uh, even uh, already in the uh, second and third century, we go back to the time of the Crusaders in the 10th and the 11th um, century, that even though they came um, from Europe uh, to conquer the land uh, from the Muslims, uh, but their goal was also uh, to uh, destroy uh, the Jews, uh, who from their point of view were the, uh, were the Christ killers. Later on, uh, uh, we know what happened during the Inquisition and, uh, and the pogroms in Russia. And of course, uh, during the Holocaust, uh, where six million Jews uh, were killed. And for many Jewish people, uh, Hitler was, um, uh, obviously, he was not a Jew. He was not a uh, Muslim. He was not a Buddhist. He was a Christian. In fact, uh, sadly, he used many of the writings of the great reformer, Martin Luther, uh, against the Jews. Uh, so for these reasons, uh, uh, particularly in the last uh, few decades, uh, the term Messianic Jew uh, is, has become much more popular. However, whether we use Messianic Jew or Jewish Christians, uh, we believe in the same. And I think one of the important aspects uh, of the name is really that uh, we have one common faith, one baptism, and one spirit. In fact, in Ephesians 2, uh, Paul talks about that we are one new man in Christ. And I think that that's really uh, the connecting point uh, that should be between us. Uh, so that's uh, our uh, common belief. And at the same time, uh, 
there is a challenge uh, with many uh, of those who uh, among us uh, that we use the term messianic Jew uh, that we also um, have a tendency and I would say sometimes a tendency that goes too far uh, to maintain our Judaism uh, even to the side of the rabbinical uh, Judaism. That's why in uh, the States, I'm not so familiar uh, of the messianic uh, synagogues or messianic congregations in, uh, uh, in UK, but I know in the States there are many messianic uh, congregations or messianic synagogues that most of the people there are actually Gentiles, uh, and to me, it's a little bit ironic to see all these um, Gentile Jews, you know, wearing a, a yarmulke, a kippah, wearing a talit, and uh, dancing um, with the Torah scroll. Um, so, and uh, and I think that some uh, have even cut themselves from the main body of Christ by uh, not attending uh, any quote called Christian churches. And I believe that that's, um, uh, that's also wrong. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit uh, my, uh, my take on that. And I would come back to that uh, towards the end uh, of my lecture. But in between now, I just want to talk a little bit um, about uh, life in Israel and what God has been doing in the land uh, since 1948. And I think that also is, uh, is an important issue uh, uh, for, our, uh, for our discussion. Uh, in um, 1948, uh, obviously Israel uh, uh, became a state. Uh, often uh, we, we say that from the ashes of Auschwitz, uh, uh, the land of Israel uh, was, uh, was reborn. Uh, but something more important in some ways uh, happened even, uh, uh, even before 1948, and that was the rebirth of the Hebrew language. Now, as you, you know, Hebrew is one of the more ancient uh, languages, uh, and yet uh, for almost 2,000 years, it really wasn't a spoken language was a language that uh, J the Jews used only in the synagogue for the reading of the scripture um, and prayers, but not really for, uh, for the daily language. Um, uh, one reason for that was uh, uh, many of the Jews uh, who were also religious said that this is the language that God has spoken to us. He has communicated with us. We cannot and we should not use it. Uh, for a common, uh, common conversation and common words. I think the other reason, uh, which was no less important in some ways, was that as the Jews were scattered all over the world, in order to survive, uh, they had to speak uh, the language of the country in which they, are, they were living. Um, that's even true today. Um, if we take the case also in, uh, uh, in Britain, uh, most Jewish uh, people who live in, uh, in Britain uh, and in UK, uh, they don't speak Hebrew. They, uh, they speak British or they speak uh, uh, English. And the same is true for uh, American Jews who, who live in the States. Uh, they speak uh, uh, English or American English, but not Hebrew. And yet uh, in the early 19th century, uh, uh, one of the uh, Lithuanian immigrants uh, by the name of Eliezer ben Yehuda. Uh, he believed that uh, now that he's in the land, even though Israel was not a state, of course, we need to speak uh, the Hebrew language. And he was the one who started the, what it's called uh, the rebirth of the Hebrew language. At the beginning, he was living in Jerusalem. But in some ways, there was a lot of opposition from the Jewish people, particularly the religious people, eventually moved to Tel Aviv uh, and start the first school in Hebrew language. He started publishing the first magazine or newspaper in, 
uh, in Hebrew and came up um, also with the first uh, Hebrew dictionary. So he's the, the father of the modern, uh, modern day uh, Hebrew language. And the fact that all of a sudden the Hebrew language, uh, the language of the scriptures became uh, a lively language and a life language that was spoken Eventually, in 1948, when, uh, when Israel was, was reborn, uh, we realized that in the sovereign plan of God, the restoration of the language and the restoration of the land, together, they provided or paved the way uh, for the restoration of the people. Um, in 1948, there were maybe about a handful uh, of Jewish uh, believers uh, in the country. And as more and more Jews were coming from different uh, countries, um, they were still speaking uh, the language uh, of the countries from which they were coming. But of course, eventually they, they would have to learn uh, Hebrew and become and to be and became part of the uh, the Hebrew speaking uh, people of Israel, and I think in part of the plan of God for the redemption uh, of the Jewish people, it was uh, this combination uh, of the language and land as uh, that really brought and enabled the church among the Jewish people uh, to be reestablished. I always give the example of our um, publishing company. About a couple of years ago uh, in, in our publishing, uh, our accountant, um, she was from Argentina. She was an Argentinian Jew. Uh, our office manager, he was Romanian. Uh, we had another lady uh, working uh, uh, with us, uh, she was an Iraqi Jew. Another lady, she was from Sweden, uh, Swedish Jew. Uh, and two sisters who were working with us, uh, they were from the state of Georgia, not in state, but the Georgia uh, from uh, former Soviet Union. Um, and so, you know, 40, 50 years ago, in order to reach out to these Jewish people, you needed to speak all these languages. But now, in the sovereign hand of God, God has brought all these Jewish people from all over the, the world into one tiny land of Israel. And they all speak the Hebrew language. Uh, earlier, um, we, we heard the words of Christ from uh, Matthew 28. Um, go to all uh, nations and make disciples uh, of all people. And, uh, and what we are seeing here in Israel today is that in some ways, the nations have come to us. Um, both our daughters uh, served in the military. It's part of the uh, life in Israel. Uh, military service, both for men and women, is mandatory, both of them served uh, in the education corps. And our older daughter, uh, one of her uh, main role was actually teaching Hebrew to new immigrant soldiers. In one of those uh, uh, occasions at the end of the three month course, um, what we call in Hebrew the Ulpan, um, we were invited uh, to the base to participate in, the, in that graduation. Um, and in that graduation, there were 135 or 140 uh, soldiers that finished their three months of Hebrew training. And they were from no less than, uh, than 38 or 41 uh, countries that have come to Israel uh, to serve and they have learned Hebrew. So again, this just shows how God has brought all these Jewish people um, from all over the world into one tiny land uh, and we all uh, speak the Hebrew language. So that was really in many ways the way that God worked out to bring back 
the Jewish people to himself and to reestablish the church that really began uh, among the Jewish people. We know that uh, the first disciples were Jewish, the writers of the New Testament were Jewish. And yet for 2000 years, Jewish mission was not under the radar um, of, the, of the church. Uh, in fact, um, uh, when I studied um, at Westminster, our uh, history teacher, he talked about uh, uh, four periods uh, of the church uh, history. He would say that in Pentecost, the church was formed. Later on, uh, during the Middle Ages, the church was deformed. And during the Reformation, the church was reformed. Uh, and about 200 years after the Reformation, the church was also transformed. And part of that transformation was not only where various uh, mission uh, organizations started uh, sending out missionaries all over the world, but also uh, mission among the Jewish people started and actually in, uh, in Scotland, uh, that's where we, to Robert May McChain, uh, a society was set up after his uh, trip to, you know, to, to Palestine, to, to the land of uh, Israel of the time. Um, a society was started that was called the Society for Propagation of the Christian Faith among the Jewish people. Uh, and that organization that goes back to what was uh, not too long ago, Christian witness to uh, to Israel, which had given uh, was uh, part of that, uh, our publishing of that ministry, really became uh, one of the oldest organizations or mission organization to the Jewish people. So we see that how also um, the, the church uh, was becoming more aware of its call to the Jewish people. Um, Paul in Romans 1, 16 says, talking about the, uh, the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. But for almost 2,000 years, that first part, to the Jew first, um, was, uh, was forgotten. But even though uh, the church uh, forgot about Israel, but God never forsook or forsake uh, the people of, uh, uh, of Israel. And a little bit about numbers, even though, uh, you know, we don't like to talk about numbers uh, because of uh, what happened to David when he, uh, King David, when he numbered his, uh, his soldiers. I mentioned earlier that in 1948, uh, there were maybe a handful uh, of uh, Jewish uh, believers. Uh, today, uh, the numbers are not so clear, but they're talking about maybe uh, 27 to 30,000 uh, Jewish believers that are part of about uh, almost uh, 300 uh, congregations and, and home groups. Uh, now, of course, uh, even 30,000 out of uh, 9 million uh, is still very, very small percentage. Uh, According to the missiologists, uh, if there are less than 2% of the people who are in a country that are uh, Christian, it is considered as an unreached. And, uh, uh, and so we are still in many ways uh, an unreached uh, people. Um, and, um, and the gospel outreach is desperately needed uh, also here um, in the land of, uh, uh, of Israel. I mentioned something about the numbers. Uh, I think it's also important to say something uh, uh, about the need, not just of the gospel, uh, but of Christian literature uh, in Israel. Uh, I mentioned something about the Hebrew language, uh, that it was not uh, a lively language. It was not spoken uh, till really uh, early 19th century and uh, particularly after 1948. But still in Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew language, most of the 66 books of the Bible, there are no Hebrew commentaries for them. 
We don't have any uh, theological or systematic theology book. Uh, we don't have any introduction to the Old or the New Testament. Um, at the moment, the only church history book that is available uh, is what Hagefen published many years ago. Um, and it's the, it goes to the, from the time of the apostles uh, to the time of the Constantine in the third and fourth century. Uh, after that, there is no church history book in the Hebrew. And there are so many other areas um, that there is a literature lacking. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that uh, I'm uh, working uh, in publishing uh, those Christian material in Hebrew in order to provide uh, a solid foundation for the church that uh, it can stand upon it. And that was also my uh, the reasons that I was involved uh, in the funding of uh, Israel Education Forum, or the, um, the IEF. The other challenge that we have uh, in Israel is that probably I would say uh, at least 70 or maybe even more uh, percent of the pastors in Israel uh, don't have any um, formal uh, theological training. Um, and so uh, that's an area that there is so much need. But also in the recent years, we are grateful and thankful that uh, we are seeing uh, many young people, uh, young Israelis coming to faith, but many of them are coming to faith, not to the churches, to establish churches, but often um, to various uh, social media and YouTube videos that are put out but by great ministries, uh, for example, one for Israel, that I'm part of the board of one for Israel, uh, and other ministries. Uh, but as these young uh, men and women are coming to faith, they are not connected uh, to any church because they came to faith through the social media. So they get a lot of the teaching uh, through the social media. Uh, and, and of course, uh, just because um, somebody on the YouTube uh, holds the Bible or quotes uh, some verses doesn't mean that he's teaching the true gospel uh, of grace that was found uh, in the scriptures. So that's uh, part of the challenges uh, that uh, the church um, is, um, is facing. Um, at the same time, um, uh, one of the good things that are happening um, in Israel is that we have the National pastors um, uh, of uh, in Israel, uh, since the church is still in many ways is it's in infant stages, uh, there's not really any denomination uh, churches in Israel. Most churches are are independent, um, whether they are Baptist or Messianic uh, or Charismatic or Pentecostal, um, but. Because of that, uh, in fact, uh, I think that it's uh, something that is very unique that we have um, what we call the national uh, pastors and elders. Once every couple of months, uh, we meet uh, to discuss various um, issues uh, uh, facing the church. Uh, in the past, there were a lot of issues with the persecution against uh, the church, uh, particularly from the Orthodox and the ultra ultra uh, Orthodox Jews. <coughs> Sorry, uh, but in recent years uh, there has been some quiet, uh, at least in, in most part of that, um, and yet that's uh, something that we see unique uh, in in Israel uh, that we can gather together both. Uh, from the various uh, sides and aspects of the of the church and the various theological viewpoint, but we can gather together, work together for the cause um, of the gospel. Now I want to uh, go back a little bit uh, to the issue um, that I uh, uh, mentioned uh, at the beginning about. Um, uh, Messianic Jews 
uh, versus uh, Christianity. I mentioned something about the persecution um, uh, of the of the church uh, by the church, um, and uh, and the fact that things have changed uh, and for um, uh, for the good. And uh, and I think that uh, one of the things that we need to to realize uh, in relationship. Uh, uh, to the name uh, is why often we as Jewish believers uh, prefer to use the term Messianic Jews. Uh, as I mentioned, um, the issue of the faith and the and the belief is not the issue, but I think it's more of a semantic, but an important uh, semantic. Um, um, in the, in the New Testament, in, in the book of uh, Romans, I mentioned about Romans, uh, uh, Romans 1, 16 to the Jew first. But also in Romans 9, 10, and 11, <clears throat> Paul writes uh, about the fact uh, that God is not done uh, with the Jewish people. Um, I think those three chapters in some ways are a parenthesis almost that Paul is uh, uh, opening up. And in fact, if we take those three chapters, Romans 19 and 11 away, uh, we can still read kind of fairly well. Uh, we can jump from Romans 8 uh, to Romans 12. And I think that what Paul is really doing in those three chapters is he's really trying to answer a question that would rightly come to the mind of Christians, and that is that, well, if God is faithful, then how is it that the Jewish people as a whole have rejected their Messiah? And of course, that was uh, the case uh, at that time and for almost 2,000 years, and even now, most Jewish people still uh, reject uh, the Messiah. Uh, and I think that Paul Paul really answering that question by so cleverly as a, as a trained rabbi under Gamliel, uh, logically telling us that God is sovereign and in his sovereignty, he has allowed a temporary blindness to come upon the Jewish people until all of Israel will be saved. And I think that what Paul is doing here in these three chapters, he's trying to say that from the very beginning, from the beginning of the world, God's redemptive plan of salvation was for the Jews and for the Gentiles. In fact, when John the Baptist saw Christ uh, at the baptism, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. He didn't say to has come to take away the sin of the Jewish people or the house of Israel, but the sins of the world. Uh, and already we can see even in the Old Testament, while most of those who believed in the God of Israel, in the one God of Israel, even though the, the majority, the large majority were Jewish, uh, but already throughout uh, that time, all of the promises that God gave was also for the foreigners and sojourners. We know about uh, Rahab. Uh, we've seen the genealogy of Christ. Uh, people like her um, and uh, Ruth, the, the Moabite, uh, who were part of the uh, household of God, part of the uh, the family of God and part of the genealogy um, uh, of Christ. Uh, but all of a sudden, uh, in these last 2,000 years, there has been a switch in a sense that uh, the Jewish people being a majority in terms of uh, believing in the, in the one God, we have become a, not only a, sh a very, very, very small minority, but in many ways, uh, we have almost become, particularly we see that among the Orthodox Jews, as the enemies 
uh, of Christ. Uh, we see that already in the time of Christ, but certainly uh, in our time, as we, uh, as I mentioned about uh, some of the persecution um, of various uh, uh, Jewish sects. But what Paul is saying is that there is a temporary blindness that God has brought so that the gospel would go from the Jewish people to the Gentiles and would come back again uh, to the Jewish people. I always ask the question, even though it's a hypothetical question, what would have happened if we as the Jewish people would have embraced Christ at the time of his coming as a people? Of course, that didn't happen. It's, as I said, it's a hypothetical question. But most likely, and again, humanly speaking, what would happen would have been that the faith in Jesus would have remained within the geographical, but also ethnical uh, limited of the Jewish people and the land of Israel. However, because of our rejection, as Paul again and again says it in, in the book of Acts in his missionary journeys, as he would go to the, uh, to the synagogue sharing and preaching the gospel, when they would reject him, he would go uh, to the Gentiles. Uh, we read about that also in Acts chapter 8, as persecution started, uh, the Jews, all of the believers, all the Jewish uh, Christians, so Messianic Jews, whatever we may uh, use that term, except the apostles, they left Jerusalem. And that's exactly what Jesus said that would happen. He said, and you shall be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my, my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the remotest parts of the world. In fact, we can take the book of Acts and we can divide it uh, in that sense that, you know, the gospel started in Jerusalem in the Pentecost. It was there. And then from there, it moved to uh, Judea and Samaria. And the last two chapters of Acts, we find Paul in Rome, which at the time, in many ways, what the kind of the, uh, the remotest parts of the world uh, of, uh, of that time. So, uh, so it was actually because of, the re of that rejection, because of that temporal blindness that God brought upon the Jewish people, that the gospel went from the Jewish people uh, into, um, into the Gentiles. Uh, but Paul talks about um, the fact that the day would come uh, that all Israel uh, shall, be, uh, shall be saved. And I know there are uh, various, various views uh, on that, uh, on that understanding, whether it's uh, really the Jewish people or whether it's the church, uh, if the church has not, uh, whether the church has not uh, uh, replaced uh, the Jewish people because of the rejection of the Messiah. Um, and again, as I started uh, uh, by saying that it's not about Israel, I think also Romans 9, 10, and 11, in many ways, it's not about us. It's not about the Jewish people. But it's really about the faithfulness of God to his promises and to his people. And I think what Paul is trying to help us to realize is that if God was not, and if God is not faithful to the Jewish people that he made the promises to them, then really we, as a church today, would not have any hope either. Now we can read uh, the Old Testament and we can see again and again the failure of the people of Israel. We can see the failure of the people of Israel today. We can see it in the last 2000 years since the time of Christ. Um, and I think that if we would look today particularly today, especially after uh, the COVID and everything that has happened to the church, I think that uh, the performance of the church in many ways has not been any better than the performance of the Jewish people in the Old Testament or since then. 
So if God would reject the Jewish people because of their failure, then we really, as a church, don't have any hope that because of our failure, God would not reject us and would adopt, quote, quote, um, another group of people. But as it is, and because God is faithful, and we see that throughout the history and in Romans 19 and 11, by saying that in this way, all Israel will be saved, it gives us, it gives the church of God, both the Gentile and the Jews, the Jewish church, which is one, uh, a great hope that God would remain faithful to us because he's the covenant keeper and we are um, the covenant breaker. So I think that because of that, uh, we are seeing uh, that God is doing an amazing work uh, in Israel in this last uh, couple of years and particularly in this uh, this last decade. We see that uh, in our church, I think in the last two, three years, despite of the corona, uh, we had quite few baptisms uh, and most of those People who've been baptized, um, I would say their average age is maybe about uh, 22 or 24. Uh, obviously, there are older people coming to faith, uh, but the, most of them uh, are young people. And many of these young people are very talented. And many of them have a great zeal of uh, sharing the gospel, uh, whether it's at school or in the, the military or in the university campuses. Uh, or wherever uh, they are working, um, we see um, a ministry, not only in our church, but many other churches and uh, organizations, among the Holocaust survivors, uh, which again, uh, for me, uh, it is a great miracle, um, because uh, the fact that uh, we just had uh, another uh, group of Holocaust survivors, about 60 of them in our church, uh, uh, about 10 days ago, celebrating with them uh, uh, about uh, uh, the Passover. Um, and the fact that these Holocaust survivors who, who went to the most horrible and tragic thing uh, that a human person can go to, um, maybe some of the things that people are seeing today in Ukraine is to some degree maybe only to some degrees, maybe if, uh, similar uh, uh, in that sense. But those people came out of the Holocaust saying that where was God when all these things were happening to us? And of course, many of them, uh, they blamed the Christians and Christ for that. Because as I said earlier to them, uh, Hitler uh, was a Christian. And so 60, 70 years, uh, 70 some years after what they've gone through, for them to walk into a Christian church, I believe that it's nothing less uh, than the miracle of God. And I think that uh, uh, in our church, we are not shy about who we are. They know we are a, uh, we are a Christian church, we are Messianic Jews even though we don't have a cross, but they, whenever they come uh, to the congregation, whatever event that we have, whether we invite them to our congregation, whether we take them on a day tours, uh, or whether we visit them uh, in, their, uh, in their clubs, there is always, always a Christ-centered message, whether it's from the Old Testament or New Testament, but always Christ is the center piece uh, of whatever we do with them. Uh, about uh, a year ago, uh, one of them by the name of Peter or, uh, was 78 years old. Uh, he was converted. Uh, that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, not only to the Jew and Gentile, but whether he's young uh, or old. So we are seeing that God is doing a great work, and that really is a showcase of the fact uh, that more uh, is to come because God is not done yet uh, with the people of Israel. 
more than 98% uh, uh, of the Jewish people uh, here in Israel still need to hear uh, the gospel. Uh, they still need to realize uh, that Jesus um, is not uh, a Gentile prophet uh, of Christians, but he's the, the Jewish Messiah that was promised uh, in the Old Testament. And that is our goal, that is our hope, but that is also above all the promise that God has made uh, to the Jewish people. So, so God has not uh, replaced Israel by the church. Israel is, as Jewish people, we are not special, but we are only a tool in God's hand and he has used us as a showcase for his grace, for his faithfulness, and for his goodness. And God often has used us uh, even, uh, even when we fail. Um, I mentioned earlier that I uh, grew up uh, in Iran. Uh, in Farsi, there is, a, there is a kind of a proverb that says that uh, uh, a man asks uh, a very cultured and polite person where he learned to be so polite and cultured. And he said, I learned it from those who are not. What they did, I did not do. So I hope that uh, God has used us also uh, in our failures uh, to show how we should not act. But also I hope that in the near future, that Israel would be a nation that is not only uh, making uh, an advancement and uh, providing various technologies, agricultural, in, uh, sec uh, in security and defense and all other kind of uh, um, contribution to the world, materialistic contribution, but the day would come that we would become again the light to the nations that we were called also uh, in the spiritual way and uh, the spiritual aspect. Um, and I believe that in God's timing, uh, that would happen. And I think we are seeing small fruit of that or the first fruit of that uh, already uh, in our land and, uh, and beyond. I think my time is up. Uh, I don't know if uh, if I have a few more minutes or if uh, we need to go into Q&A. Um, yeah, another, another, maybe another five minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that'd be fine. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, well, I, uh, then in that sense, let me say just a few words about um, life as a... a Jewish uh, believer uh, in Israel. Uh, well, for many, in many ways, um, life for us is no different than maybe for you uh, in, in, in Scotland or in UK or, uh, or where you are. Um, but for us, the challenge is that uh, often our people tell us that by believing in Jesus, uh, we are not Jewish anymore, or we have forsaken uh, our Jewishness. And it's very ironic because uh, for them, uh, as a Jew, I can be a Buddhist and I'm still a Jew. I can even almost uh, believe in anything or not believe in God, and I'm still a Jew. But the minute that I believe in the Jewish Messiah, who was born as a Jew, lived, died, and raised as a Jew, then I'm not Jewish. And I think that because of that, for us, it's really important to actually to show to our people that yes, we believe in Jesus. Uh, we believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah. We believe that Jesus is the son of God as, as we read in the Old and the New Testament. But at the same time, we are as Jewish as they are, maybe even more so. And that's why um, most of our children attend uh, public schools. Um, um, 
we don't uh, we don't have uh, we do have one uh, messianic uh, school in Jerusalem uh, that people attend but most of our children attend uh, uh, public school uh, most of us uh, when our sons are born we circumcise them not because we believe that that adds anything in terms of the salvation or the relationship to God uh, but because it's part of our tradition and we want to make sure that uh, people realize and our children realize uh, that we are as Jewish as anyone else. Uh, our kids, uh, they serve in the military just like anyone else. In fact, they had such a great um, testimony that in many of the unique and elite units, uh, the commanding officers, they want to have Jewish Christians because they realize that these are soldiers that are very obedient. Uh, they don't do drugs. They don't cause troubles. They are not. There is no uh, sexual immorality, and they are the ones that the the first to volunteer uh, when there are needs for volunteers. Uh, when the Jewish people on uh, on Saturday on Shabbat morning they go to synagogue, we go to churches. Uh, we pay as the, we pay taxes just like any other person in Israel, any other Jewish people, uh, we dress very much like them. Uh, and even though we look like them, uh, we don't always necessarily try to uh, behave like them, uh, but we want to behave uh, in a Christ manner. Uh, and I think that that's also part of uh, the use of the name of a messianic Jew uh, rather than uh, than a Jewish Christian or Hebrew Christian uh, or Christian. So that also ties us back um, uh, to our subject that because of that, uh, you know, we want to use the term messianic Jew uh, in order to, to be all things, as Paul said, you know, we want to be all things to all men and we want to be uh, Jewish um, uh, to our Jewish people in order to bring them um, to the gospel. And that's part of uh, our calling um, in the land. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Um, that was very insightful and very helpful. And uh, also just to learn more about what God is actually doing in the land through uh, either uh, Messianic Jews or uh, Jewish Christians. We, we'll have a, a session for questions if you want to ask a question. I have a friend here in Switzerland who is very active in an organization or movement which is called the Towards Jerusalem, Towards Jerusalem Council too, usually uh, quoted with uh, the abbreviation TJC2. Do you know of that movement? And is that a significant movement? Yes, I'm very much aware of that. That has been the subject, uh, the tikkun uh, has been a subject that has been uh, dealt with in the national pastors and elders meeting uh, here. Um, you know, I, I do want to say that part of the whole tikkun uh, and you know, just like many uh, any movement or organization, it has various uh, uh, parts uh, to it. Um, but uh, the idea uh, we is that um, uh, of that movement is trying to bring together all uh, the the Christians, uh, both also even um, uh, Catholic and other uh, uh, Christians. Uh, to align um, under the Jewish church, because that's what happened in the Acts chapter 15. Uh, so uh, so that is the idea there of the, towards the Second Jerusalem uh, Council. Um, I personally believe that, uh, you know, there is no need uh, for a second uh, uh, council. What unites us uh, is, uh, is Christ and the scriptures. Um, and as Jewish people, um, you know, we are, uh, even though I mentioned that, you know, the, everything started here and with us uh, and would end here, but, uh, you know, we don't have any, 
I would say, uh, firstborn right uh, over the Gentile church. Uh, I think there's many things that we can learn uh, from the Gentile church, and hopefully we can uh, also teach something uh, to, the gen, uh, to the Gentile church as well. But I don't believe that there is um, a need uh, that the Gentile church uh, should align itself behind us uh, in a sense that uh, we need to uh, guide and direct them theologically uh, how they should uh, live their lives. Okay, thank you. May I ask, David, do you celebrate in your church and individually the Jewish feasts along with the other Jews? Um, uh, yes, we do. In fact, um, you know, uh, in the last two years, because of the restrictions of uh, COVID, we couldn't. But we often uh, celebrate them, um, particularly Passover. And I think that really um, there is nothing more significant in terms of the gospel uh, that to celebrate the Passover in light of its great fulfillment uh, in Christ. So we don't read the whole Haggadah. We don't maintain everything uh, uh, that the Jewish tradition uh, keeps. Uh, but we certainly celebrate it. Uh, uh, we talk about uh, how God uh, in the uh, in the Old Testament, in the first Passover, uh, delivered us from uh, slavery to Egyptian. And to Christ, he delivered us from Satan and sin. And that, that first Passover was a great pointer um, uh, to Christ, who is our Passover, as Paul says in, in in Corinthians. So we celebrate it, we celebrate Hanukkah, we celebrate Purim, it's a great festival for the children, but remembering uh, not only God's protection back then as we read in the book of Esther, but also how God protected the seed of the woman until the coming of Christ, and even now how God has brought us back here in Christ uh, and protecting us. So we celebrate them uh, in light of the, their fulfillments, all of their fulfillments in in Christ. Would anybody agree with me that perhaps in the West, uh, in the church, we have lost something by not knowing much or celebrating the feasts and there would perhaps be greater understanding of sin and the consequences of it and what salvation means to us if we celebrated the feasts more in the West? It's a very good question, Irene. And uh, <laughs> I know that um, you know, there are Christians around Scotland who probably do celebrate uh, Passover and some other feasts. Um, I, I think it would be up to each individual congregation um, how they go about doing that. We lived for many years in Gateshead, which was home to a very prestigious rabbinical training college and uh, a large community of ultra-Orthodox Jews. We didn't have very much contact with them, but we did have contact from time to time through, um, for instance, educational projects in, in the Gateshead schools. Um, my question is, what is the eschatological hope for Orthodox Jews and how does it relate to their understanding of um, a Messiah as they uh, explore that in the text of the Old Testament? Well, I, I should start by saying that, as you know, when um, there is a saying that uh, when there are two Jewish people, there are at least three opinions. Uh, so it, I, I think that uh, it's uh, it, much of it depends um, on uh, on on the Jewish uh, Orthodox uh, groups. But first of all, we have to realize that in the in Judaism, and certainly in the Orthodox Judaism, they don't view sin in the way that we see it uh, in the scripture. Uh, they believe that uh, when God created Adam and Eve, uh, he created them with both good and bad uh, um, uh, intentions uh, in a sense and our goal in this world is uh, really to make sure that 
the, the good side uh, overcomes um, uh, the bad side. And we do that by the keeping of the law, by keeping those 613 uh, laws uh, found in the, in the Torah. So the idea of, uh, and, and when you don't have a clear understanding of the sin, then you don't need necessarily uh, a Messiah in a sense, uh, in the way that uh, we perceive it uh, uh, and we understand it in, in the scripture. Uh, some years ago, I, I had a very eye-opening uh, experience uh, with one of the uh, Orthodox rabbis, they were giving us a very, very hard time in uh, one of the uh, book, uh, uh, we had a bookshop outside on the street, it was uh, the week of the books, and uh, and after a long conversation with him, uh, he told me, he said, you know, I see that you have a good soul, uh, but you are lost, but maybe when you die and you come back as a cow, uh, then you know, uh, you would be in a better position. And I didn't understand what he was uh, saying. I said, you know, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, uh, because because I believe in Jesus, you know, I'm lost. He said, but when you die, maybe you can come as a cow and you would become a stake. And I'm not joking. That's exactly his words that he said. You become an stake and a good rabbi would say the blessing over you because when they eat anything, they give uh, the blessing. Uh, and in this way, uh, you would become better. And when he said that, and I couldn't understand it, later on I went to a little bit to examine that. And I realized that the whole idea of reincarnation is very strong, uh, particularly among the ultra uh, Jews, because that's the way of giving a person a second chance. And the second chance is by you're dying and you come back as a, another person, another animal, another thing. And there you are kind of improving yourself. Because in this world, at the moment, there is no Messiah. So you are on your own to, quote, quote, uh, save yourself and make yourself a better person. So I think that for many of them, uh, uh, the idea of the Messiah, that when Messiah would come, uh, it would be a utopic uh, world uh, where, you know, everything would would be great. Uh, most of them, certainly the Chabad Jews and uh, uh, the, day ra the dead rabbi believe that if one Shabbat or one sh Sabbath, all the Jews all over the world would keep the Sabbath as God meant it, which means the way they understand it, then the Messiah would come back. Um, and to them, uh, again, uh, I, I'm doing my, uh, I'm writing my dissertation, I'm doing my doctorate in, uh, uh, in a seminary, and uh, part of my dissertation is preaching Christ in the minor prophets. And one of the prophets, uh, one of the big rabbis uh, who passed recently, uh, he used to say that in every generation, uh, there is a Messiah, uh, and that Messiah is not revealed until the time uh, would come. Uh, so that's uh, the, uh, the view. Uh, the real hope uh, is, uh, is that God would be merciful uh, and is the really hope that they have is by works. So it's a uh, quote, quote, uh, uh, salvation by works um, and, uh, and not salvation to a gracious Messiah who, who was sacrificed. In terms of Isaiah 53, they, they read that, um, even though they don't read it in the daily reading in the synagogue, uh, but they believe that there it talks uh, either about David or most of them believe that it talking the, the suffering servant uh, is the people of Israel. Thank you. And we thank you very, very much, David, for coming this evening. Uh, especially at such short notice. Thank you. Thank you for joining with us for this lecture. For more information about future lectures, please visit our website www.iefinternational.com or contact us directly via our email address info at iefinternational.com. We hope that you have been blessed by what has been shared and we look forward to connecting with you in the future.